afternoon our viewers we would like to thank God for the opportunity that uh, he has afforded us to come and uh, witness and uh, f and minister through the stories behind the hymns I would like to commend uh, the opportunity that has been afforded to us as well by Hope Channel Uganda and we uh, may the good Lord bless its its ministry my name is Paul Mugera and uh, professionally I'm a financial economist but in terms of uh, church ministry, um, I'm, uh, I, I congregate from SDA Church in Gobe, which is uh, in Wankuluku district, which is the newly, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the new district that has been, uh, uh, that, has, that, that has been cut out from SDA Church in Ajana Nkumbi. And I serve as a church elder, but also I, as a music evangelist and other ministries like uh, family ministries and all that. So we are glad that we're going to be ministering uh, with you. Um, allow me also have our br my brother introduce himself. Uh, <coughs> good afternoon, viewers. My name is uh, Elder William Mugerwa from Nalia SDA Church in Chireka Church District. I serve as an elder. I am also uh, in charge of uh, church and personal development. I am also in charge of family ministries and serve as the development director at the district. Uh, in day-to-day uh, -day life, I'm a development economist uh, where I try to work to see how uh, private sector approaches can actually help the poorer people in our midst to actually get mainstream into the economy and actually be able to earn a living and respect. Thank you, thank you. So without so much ado, we are going to begin with, our, with, our, with, uh, with one of the most beloved, beloved songs and that is none other than Stand up, stand up for Jesus. This song is popular 
across the Christian communities, regardless of the denomination. And uh, giving a background about it, records have it that uh, during the 1857 and 58 revival that broke out in uh, Philadelphia in uh, the USA, uh, it, is, it, is, it is said that a young preacher who was called uh, Dudley Tang one day preached to, uh, to, to a huge congregation of 5,000 men. And as he was preaching, he made use of a scripture in Exodus 10, 11, which, uh, ex uh, which of course charged men by saying that, Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. And after that evangelistic campaign, records have it that a whole 1,000 men responded to his invitation and they got baptized and they joined uh, uh, the church. So what happened was that uh, uh, after that tedious uh, activity, he decided to retreat to his uh, country home to try to have a recreation and, uh, you know, as he refocuses on, on his ministry. So as he had gone to his country home, records have it that on one Wednesday, uh, as he was trying to check one of, uh, you know, uh, one of his maize meals, Unfortunately, when he uh, fixed his hand into the meal, his hand was, uh, was cut off. In short, it appears the meal was, uh, was, was in operation. So his, so his hand was cut off. So he bled a lot. He bled a lot. And by the time they picked him tried to try to take him to the hospital, he had, uh, he was, he had significantly bled to, uh, to, to the maximum. And, uh, of course, the news was, uh, was sent out to his colleagues who were working with him uh, during the evangelistic campaigns. When they came, the truth is that he was in bad shape and they couldn't uh, hide it. So when he saw them, he expected them to motivate him to sing and, uh, you know, to give him uh, that kind of faith. Unfortunately, they couldn't do that because they saw that their brother was uh of, of, of course was his life was going so what he did was to exhort them and ask them can't you men sing why don't you sing for the lord so in the process of course he was using a lot of energy and in a few minutes he lost his life so uh those words <clears throat> they unsettled one of his colleagues and that colleague uh as he went back that colleague was called george dufield who was he who is one of uh uh, the prominent uh, uh, hymn composers. As he was going back home, he couldn't forget the words of his brother, the word of his fellow minister. And so they would ring into his mind as they would be connected to the scripture in Exodus. Uh, during that period, then this song was born into his mind that was aimed at charging men that stand up for Christ uh, the war is raging, but you should you should have the confidence that our Lord is 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 victorious. So we, we shouldn't fear. So in short, all that exhortation that is found in this song was as a result of the sermon that uh, uh, Dudley Tang's, uh, uh, of course, that, that preached, which saw a thousand uh, uh, converts, but also the admonition that he gave them when he was on his sick bed. And so this saw George Diffield come up with this song. Which was uh, whose intention was to steam, was to charge us to stand as men and uh, fight for the Lord, my brother. Yes, please. Uh, what do you have to say about men? Much as this song, of course, was directed to all the the Christians, regardless of their gender, but in a part particular way, uh, George Dufield wanted to focus so much on men to show them their position in this world. What's your take on that? Thank you very much. Um, in essence, we ask, what does it mean to be a man? Mm -hmm. According to Proverbs 27, 17, mm -hmm. iron sharpens iron, mm -hmm. and so a man sharpens his fellow man. Yeah. According to George Duffield, really what he meant was that from the very beginning, God created man and charged him with a position of responsibility, yeah. a position of leadership. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> leadership at home, leadership in the church, mm -hmm. leadership uh, in the secular world. Oh, yeah. in the so right. men are called out to lead. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I would like to talk about 10 qualities mm -hmm. that actually define what being a man means. Yeah, yeah. First of all, men need action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, 
the image of a man mm. is reflected more in what he does mm. than what he says. Yeah. So real men speak less mm. and they do more. Very interesting. Okay. Mm. Secondly, men need safety. Mm. Men, as they are growing up, they are told not to show emotions. Mm -hmm. So men tend to shoulder a lot, whether it's a lot of pain, a lot of heart, mm -hmm. a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, they actually get to attain higher levels of self-control. Right. So men are meant to actually show that actually, regardless of what the situation is, mm -hmm. that they can actually take charge yeah. and take control of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, men to be, need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By being challenged, what we mean is that... Uh, if, for a man to grow, mm. for a person to grow, you need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. You cannot mm. grow by doing the very things that you do all the time mm. and repeatedly. Yeah. You can only grow by actually trying to try things that are harder, that mm. are more difficult, that are more complex. Mm. And uh, that wa that's how we grow. Even as Christians, mm. our Christian lives are enriched mm. when we encounter challenges mm. Mm. and challenging moments. That's why we say that a ship at harbor is safe. Mm -hmm. But that's not what ships are made for. Mm -hmm. They should go, in the depth actually, of the they go into the depth of the water. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are hard rocks, there are mm -hmm. crocodiles, there are all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But that's where ships fulfill mm -hmm. their mandate. Mm -hmm. So men can only grow and become better mm -hmm. by actually experiencing and going through challenges. challenges. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that men need to get to the point. Mm -hmm. uh, men don't usually require a lot of details beating around the bush. They don't beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when a man is telling a story, mm -hmm. you'll find that actually give you highlights of what they think is important. And that's natural. Mm -hmm. And actually sometimes ladies get frustrated. They want the whole, the whole juice. They want everything. Mm -hmm. They want the details. Mm -hmm. Typical mm -hmm. men don't do that. And mm -hmm. it's actually, it actually looks strange when a man actually has become such a good it's storyteller so detailed, in mm -hmm. such detail. Mm -hmm. So men don't entertain, entertain stories and beating around the bush. Mm -hmm but they're desirous of getting to the real point mm. of the matter. Mm. Uh, number five is that men need to win. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's in their DNA. As men, we grow up with the pressure to win. Mm. Mm. When, uh, when you're growing up with your sisters, mm. Mm. they might have been older than you, yeah. they might have been stronger, mm. but you always wanted to show, show, them, show them that you're stronger that you're in charge, and you're in charge and you're better off. Mm. So uh, by winning, Men grow up to be independent, mm -hmm. men grow up to be self-sufficient, yeah. and men grow up to not accept failure mm -hmm. as an option, mm -hmm. but it's something that they try to overcome all the time. Yeah. Next is actually men need to dream, mm -hmm. and to dream big. Mm -hmm. uh, by dreaming big, it doesn't mean that they become disillusioned. Mm -hmm. But you see, unlike heaven, mm -hmm. where we're likely to find you know, things that we've never thought about, things we've not seen, things that has, we've never imagined. Mm. In this world, for you to be successful, mm. there, you must actually be thinking about the things you want to become. Yeah. You cannot become what you've not thought about. Mm, certainly. Okay. Mm. And then the other one is, men need other men. Mm. You see, when you are in a society and you're the wisest man always, mm know that you are stunted and not growing. Mm. So we need people that are better than us, yeah. who can actually help us to get better, mm. who can actually challenge us to actually think beyond what the obvious is, mm. who can challenge us to improve ourselves. Mm. And uh, those men, mm. if they are around us, mm. those become our best friends. Yeah. Yeah. They encourage us along the way. Mm. Then, of course, uh, men also need help mm. Mm. around daily work. Mm. Mm. Uh, you see, Men get worn out, yeah. men get tired mm. with that work mm. or whatever it is, they get tired. Mm. So every once in a while, a man can actually use help. It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign mm. of strength mm. to ask for help. Mm. Mm. Then of course, many men need healing. Mm. You see, many men do things for which they receive no appreciation or gratitude. It's almost <laughs> taken like that's what they have to do. Mm. It's a given. It's a given. Men to provide, that's natural. If a man to, you know, defend his home, that's natural. Mm -hmm. For a man to do all those things, it's natural. Mm -hmm. But you see, when you encourage a man and appreciate, mm -hmm. it actually give them, gives them incentive. the zest mm -hmm. or an incentive to actually go out and do more. Mm -hmm. So we need to, uh, you know, <coughs> to 
to appreciate them and uh, show gratitude mm -hmm. even for small things. Yeah. Um, then finally, men need to identify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Men need to identify themselves with other men yeah. who share similar values, mm -hmm. who share a similar destiny. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about this, we are really talking about uh, men who can actually show us the way. Mm -hmm. We are Adventists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, who are the men in your life? Mm -hmm. If they aren't help you, helping you to get forward, mm -hmm. they are not increasing your hope and faith, yeah. then they are the wrong men. So we need to surround ourselves with men who can uh, encourage us along the way, mm -hmm. uh, who can actually uh, be our moral boosters as we move on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Many thanks, my brother William. Uh, that's why George uh, Diffield, uh, who, was a, who was a very close friend uh, to, uh, uh, to Dudley Tang, uh, came up with, the, with this song, which has a lot of spiritual implications, but also... Uh, you know, uh, implications for real life, trying to show us, beginning uh, in the first place, showing us that we should stand up for Christ, but men have a special position as leaders to take the lead in real life, but also in our Christian lives. God bless you as you enjoy that, uh, the resources in that music, but also uh, keeping in mind the resources that uh, William has shared as a real man. That's why we should call someone. A, that that's that's uh, that is actually what defines a real man. Have a blessed time. Thank you.
Our viewers, allow me welcome you once again to this uh, interesting and resourceful uh, program that uh, definitely that, that helps us to understand the stories behind the hymns and how they apply to our daily lives. Uh, the song we are going to handle right now is one of the most popular hymns or songs of all time. And that is none other than Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. This beautiful hymn was composed by uh, a, a, a legendary uh, hymn composer called, uh, called Reginald, Reginald Herber, who was born in 1783 and uh, he died in 1826. Uh, Reginald was... Uh, uh, of course, was 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 an Anglican clergyman, and uh, of course uh, he wrote a couple of hymns in an attempt to improve the singing in his little congregation uh, in a place called Hodnet, found in Birmingham in England. So he was so passionate about music, about worship, and he knew uh, that it would be used as a catalyst to uh, you know to edify his people, but also to uh, to, to to boost their worshipful lives. So during that time, most congregations would actually use sotas or psalms basically as we, as I mentioned, as I explained some time back, but most of them sang them badly. So uh, um, Reginald saw an opportunity to inject a bit of a spirit in the hymn singing. So what he did is that he began introducing uh, his through his congregation to church mu to modern church music some uh, and he would bring in songs uh, like Amazing Grace that was uh, composed by John Newton among others to try to liven up the spirit of these uh, uh, you know uh, parishioners to ensure that they sing with passion but also that the the singing can impact their lives so this saw him personally write a couple of hymns and uh, including Holy Holy as one of his most uh, remarkable uh, songs so but he wrote this song uh, as because they were preparing for a Trinity Sunday and so he was requested to come up with a song that would represent the Trinity or the triune God so uh, after thinking about that about this and the fact that he, was, he wanted to use uh, music to transform his people he came up or he came up with a song that was talking about God in three persons a blessed Trinity, and this song is popular, and uh, is, you know, of course, is, is is beloved across across uh, across the communities. This song has been translated in very many languages and is sung in many tongues. And uh, it is believed that this is uh, uh, this is Reginald Haber's gift to the church. Uh, records have it that at forty years, uh, at forty years, Reverend Haber reluctantly left his uh, England to go uh, and, uh, and serve as a bishop in Calcutta in India. Uh, the scope of the job combined with the hot climate and uh, the primitive conditions proved too much for Bishop uh, Haber. And this saw him uh, lose his life. Actually, he died at the age of 43. Very strange. After serving only for three years in India. His music remains as the true legacy even after his death, and a hymn was published, including all his hymns, uh, that uh, as a memory or as a legacy for his contribution. Records have it that later, his widow found uh, the, uh, f f f found a paper that had "Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty" uh, in the pap in the papers of his dear, of, of of his uh, uh, you know uh, uh, fallen uh, fallen husband. And then he picked this song, the, he picked this paper, and he took it to one of the greatest hymn composers during that time, who was called Bacchus Dyke. And he requested him to furnish uh, this, he, the, 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 that poem with a tune. So uh, Bacchus, who was, uh, uh, who was, who was, uh, who was uh, a talented musician, looked at it, and within 30 minutes he had composed a, uh, he had composed a tune, and he based that tune on uh, a place where the church came, uh, where the church agreed on the uh, on the theology of Trinity, that is called Nicaea. That's why actually the tune is called Nicaea. So John Dyke, of course, also had a controversial life as a minister 
um, and and also his life didn't uh, didn't last so long because uh, so somehow he had issues with the, with the mission that had sent him and they left him uh, to be to be in charge of a huge uh, uh, of a huge community that he was part, that he was ministering to without any support which also drained his life anyhow without going into those details uh, this gentleman composed this hymn and of course it was inspired by the fact that uh, one of the key uh, theological fundamentals that we need to appreciate is the fact that God is in three persons. Uh, that has sent, uh, of course, that that, uh, that has been a center of a lot of controversies, not only in the Christian community, but when it, it is compounded with our Muslim uh, uh, comrades who don't understand how we can worship more than one, one God. But of course, that is the fundamental of our belief that God is in three persons, and that is the intention of the song. My brother William, what yes, do you please. have to to say about uh, this song holy 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 and i know you really love this song thank you very much indeed i do uh, the issue of the trinity has been very perplexing mm -hmm. and very confusing especially for christians yeah but for our Mus muslim brothers and sisters even more mm -hmm. but you see if we talk about a god of love and if we say that god is love mm -hmm. if there was nothing or no one for him to love how could he have loved mm -hmm. very interesting so when we look at the Genesis account, mm -hmm. we hear plural, let mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. let us, mm -hmm. let us. Mm -hmm. In our image. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it means that actually God practically demonstrated this love. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated this unity. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated this ability to work mm -hmm. with others yeah. like himself mm -hmm. from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's what is expected of us. Mm -hmm. The other aspect is that, uh, you see, we have people that have a God for this, a God for that, mm -hmm. a God for this, especially in the Asian community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you see, when we talk about the God of heaven, in three persons, mm -hmm. they act not because they do the same thing, but he, ha he has, you know, aspects of the function, mm -hmm. or functions, and they act in, in unison. In unison. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, being uh, united, doesn't mean looking alike. Mm -hmm. It simply means unity of purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. it means unity of purpose. Mm -hmm. If God created us in His image, mm -hmm. there are expectations of yeah. us. Mm -hmm. You see, <coughs> when we come into this world, mm -hmm. we eventually take on families. Mm -hmm. There is the parent, the father, the mother, and, the children. and children. Yeah, it is an antitype. Mm -hmm. Of the Trinity, of the, or of the Triune God. Yes. So there is expected mm -hmm. a level of unity, mm -hmm. a level of purpose, a level of unity of you know, and harmonious, and harmonious uh, relationships in terms of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we get into church, we find you know people from all walks of life, from all the walks of life, different cultures, different languages, different mm -hmm. all sorts of things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and we expect you to get along with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we look at uh, the people we find in church, mm. some are very educated, some are not. Yeah. Some are wealthy, <coughs> some are not. Some are black, some are blue. You know, I had an opportunity to go to a church. Mm. And when I reached there, a not so elderly gentleman asked me, why have you, it was a Sabbath morning. And it was an Adventist church. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman asked me, uh, can we help you? So I said, I've come to church. Very strange so I said, uh, you might feel more comfortable mm -hmm. at the church downtown. Mm -hmm. And they gave me direction to the church downtown. Which has and indeed, your race, and in, indeed, when I got <coughs> there, I found more <coughs> black people in that mm -hmm. church and so forth. But that's not what God intended. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want a church, for, a church for the Hispanics, for the French, for the blacks, and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. God wants us to actually be united. Mm -hmm. That's how we show, can demonstrate his love mm -hmm. and his ability ability to coexist with others. Mm. Thank mm. you. Many thanks, William. I loved, uh, I really loved uh, that uh, personal experience. And uh, the rationale of the, of uh, the Trinity is, uh, that, uh, is, to, is also to, to show uh, unity in everything that we do. Uh, that's why we need to coexist with others. So that's why there is a gentleman, uh, there, is, uh, there is a theolo theologian, a theologian who was called Gerard Wheeler. He wrote a book called uh, uh, he wrote a book called Beyond Life, Beyond Life. and among uh, the chapters 
he talked about uh, he talked about restoring his image in us and he, and he was linking the trinity or the triune god or the three persons to the various elements trying to show us that god wants us to live in a community he wants us to display his love his unity and all that so comrades um uh, brethren, uh, this gentleman who composed this song had an intention of showing us that the way how our God is in three persons is, uh, should also be reflected in how we live. We live in harmony at home. We live in harmony in communities. D uh, regardless of our differences, we should have a unity of purpose. So God bless you as you enjoy that song and as you contemplate on the underlying message of uh, that song, Holy, 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 God Lord Almighty. Thank you.
Our dear viewers, we'd like to welcome you once again to this resourceful and insightful program which helps us to understand the stories behind the hymns and how they apply to our contemporary lives or to our Christian lifestyle. Some of these songs were written um, close to 500 years ago, 300 years ago and all that, but their meaning is much more alive than you would say they were uh, by the time they were composed. So this time around we're going to talk about one of the hymns that is also very uh, interesting and uh, edifying. That is none other than Wonderful Words of Life. Wonderful Words of Life was composed by one of the uh, legendary uh, hymn composers uh, by the name of Philip Bliss. Philip Bliss was born in uh, 1838 and he died in, uh, in 1876. Uh, uh, Philip Bliss uh, was, uh, of, of course, Philip Bliss was coming from a heavy Baptist background and uh, uh, he was born to religious and musical parents who lived, uh, who incidentally lived in a log cabin. That is quite strange. They lived in log cabin. It's, it's strange in this part of the world, but in that part of the world, it's not so strange. So as a young lad, records have it that he used to work on farms and in lumber camps and he accepted Christ and joined the Baptist Church at the age of 12. So uh, it is said that uh, this young man was good looking, he had a splendid physique, had a handsome face, he, was, he had a dig dignified and striking presence, but above all, he had exceptional vocal qualities, which is something very, very interesting. I've told you that this comes from a heavy Baptist background, uh, whose theology, I'm talking about the theology in this song, we all espouse as the wider Protestant, uh, uh, you know, denominations. So uh, records have it that after being trained in music by the gurus in that time, uh, among which were Jeggy Tauna, who was actually father of uh, D.B. Tauna, one of the great hymn composers, and also William uh, Bradbury, uh, also a great musician by that time, he went ahead to begin teaching music. Uh, beginning with the Rome Academy and other academies to also do to teach music. For several years, Bliss taught music during winter, uh, the winter months, and he worked on farms during summer. He really had an interesting lifestyle. So recognizing his budding talent, uh, a publishing company called Root and Kedi Publishers in Chicago offered him a flute and a job to concertize his songs and to move around, uh, you know, making concerts uh, uh, because be, uh, because they really uh, loved uh, his songs. So later on, of course, he was joined by uh, by another legendary uh, hymn composer who was uh, also a major in the army. That is Evangelist uh, 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 Webster Whittle, who who is actually the composer of a song "Showers of Blessings." And so uh, he was moving along with him as a soloist and a song leader, with whom they had they they they, they held a lot of revival meetings, camp meetings, and of course they. Uh, they, they stimulated a lot of revival uh, in the U.S. So after accepting an invitation to go to England along, along with his wife for an evangelistic meeting, he went with the wife Lucy and uh, of course went, uh, they, they went to Rome, to Rome uh, that is in Pennsylvania and they spent their Christmas with the, with the whole family. Records have it that on their return, on their return to Chicago on December 29, 1876, um, where they had to sing in Moody's uh, Tabernacle. A bridge, uh, a bridge gave way and the train plunged into an icy sea below and then it, it burst into flames. Uh, uh, when it burst in, into flames, actually what happened was that uh, uh, Philip uh, somehow escaped through the, through, the, what? Through, through the window. But then when he realized that uh, the wife uh, had, had not survived, he went back to ensure that he, that, that he could also uh, pull, pull her out. Unfortunately, both of them lost their lives. Uh, but of course, uh, Philip Bliss remains as one of the major hymn composers and whose hymns have actually effectively contributed uh, to the growth of music. Uh, Bliss, uh, Bliss's composition of this song uh, alludes to the wisdom that is a gift that, that only comes from God. And uh, he was inspired by uh, Solomon's writings in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter two, uh, verses one, uh, verses one from verses one, saying that wh whereby Solomon was giving castles to his child, my child, tune your ears to wisdom, 
and concentrate on understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden, like hidden treasure. So these are, uh, you know, councils were aimed, uh, were aimed at giving, uh, 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 at giving, uh, at giving his son uh, councils so as to make rational choices and to make long, long time, uh, you know, lifestyle uh, choices that would uh, that, that, that would reflect the goodness of God. So it's imperative to note that wisdom comes uh, of co had come through through two ways one it could be god given but it could also come from energetic search but the only lasting wisdom comes from god and that is a wash in the bible to try to uh, to give a lot a lot more of a context on this song i decided to make use of my experience uh, a 15 years experience as an educationist and basically someone who has uh, uh, who, uh, who, who, who has built, who has contributed to knowledge uh, uh, through training, uh, executive education at higher education, but also as a former education director uh, in SDH at Najana Kumbi. Then, when it still had around uh, seven, around 19 local churches, we had a philosophy of education that we are following, and that philosophy of, of, of education was none other than uh, looking at a holistic kind of education which had 10 constituents and I would like to ask my brother to give us his take on that holistic education because this song wonderful li words of life they are they are basically alluding to that kind of comprehensive education that God gives and God uh, challenges us to uh, you know to pass on to our children over to you my brother thank you my brother um, of course when we talk about holistic education we're talking about the whole person Oh, yeah. We talk about cu being culturally refined, mm -hmm. whereby we pick out the best in every culture that we come in across, mm -hmm. and we pick mm -hmm. those tenets that actually take us forward and pick them and adopt them as our culture. Yeah. So we don't get stuck in what is, you know, doesn't mm -hmm. work, what's mm -hmm. primitive and whatever, but we keep on refining and refining. Mm -hmm. Then we, uh, we look at people that are spiritually upright. You know, in order for us to be spiritually upright, mm -hmm. parents play a critical role. They are the first mm. edu religious educators of children. Mm. And when a children misses that at home, that primary education, uh, then mm. you've missed up, bring up a spiritually upright what? Mm. A person. Okay. Then uh, we would like people that are mentally alert, mm. uh, quick to understand, quick to make sound, information Des informed mm. decisions. decisions. Yeah. Okay? Mm. Uh, physically strong. Mm. This world requires people that can work mm. with their hands. Mm -hmm. No people that can I say there, that, mm -hmm. and that. People that can actually work. <laughs> okay? Especially men. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. disgusting seeing men who can't work. Yeah. And of course, um, socially sound, ability to get with interpersonal skills that allow them to get along with others. Mm -hmm. You know, these are th some of the things that actually make us uh, strong. Then, of course, uh, morally upright having principles mm -hmm. that define what is right mm -hmm. and what is wrong and living by them. Mm -hmm. it's not, not enough to know them, but living by them. Oh, yeah. And they define the way we live. Mm -hmm. uh, ethically efficient, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, people can actually, you know, uh, they can actually define mm -hmm. what is ethically acceptable. Mm -hmm. They choose to be on a higher moral ground mm -hmm. than the average person. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'd like people to be emotionally stable mm -hmm. with <coughs> emotional intelligence. intelligence people yes. who can actually control themselves, even when provoked and whatever, mm -hmm. and they can actually ride that out. Mm -hmm. You know, you're stronger when you ride it out than when you burst out. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Vocationally self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. People equipped with skills that can actually add value mm -hmm. and make them, you know, useful and productive in society. Yeah. Society doesn't need more parasites who to live on others. Mm -hmm. Society needs people that can actually work mm -hmm. and contribute and be able to live what they live. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the internationally liberal, mm -hmm. being able to accommodate others, mm -hmm. being able to understand mm -hmm. other, other people's point of view, mm -hmm. being able to be inclusive mm -hmm. and uh, tolerant of others. Yeah. We don't tolerate what is wrong, mm -hmm. but even when somebody is wrong, mm -hmm. You look at them as a human being mm -hmm. in a redemptive manner. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the 10 mm -hmm. critical aspects mm -hmm. that are defined mm -hmm. balanced education. Mm -hmm. It touches every aspect of life. And when a person mm -hmm. comes out of an edu educational setting in, in that form, mm -hmm. that's what the world yearns for. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Um, and uh, I, I, I remember that there is a scholar called Agawal 
who, uh, who, who of course espouses such values and uh, such tenets of, of education. Uh, and he, he's one of the proponents of having that kind of holistic education. But I'm glad that uh, the Bible, that's what it advocates for. And that's what we should promote our, uh, our children. We're not talking about someone who is uh, uh, so mentally upright when other faculties have not been effectively developed. So this is what Philip, th this alludes to what Philip Bliss was saying. Wonderful words of life should help us to appreciate education in, uh, in a comprehensive uh, manner. So as we enjoy this song, may we be also inspired and edified by, uh, by, by, uh, by education, that education transforms us, but, but above all education that uh, helps us to seek for eternity. Have a blessed time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.